This collage represents the 1960s and 70s. Uh, this is a very infamous ad that we had, a little heresy is good for the soul. Next to it, in 1963, this is Lyndon Johnson in a motorcade at Edwards Air Force Base. Uh, these are specially modified clip horns that were used for the PA system. <laughs> Uh, we have over here a concert at the Hollywood Bowl using Klipsch speakers, and that's Leon Redbone. Uh, we also have another infamous ad, The Heresy in the Church. There are two pictures on here that are not from the 60s and 70s, so if any of you can identify those, uh, we might have a prize for you. <laughs> This collage represents the 1980s and 90s. Uh, right here, you can see that I made the cover of Inside Arkansas Magazine in our anechoic chamber. Uh, we have the collage here that was done for Paul Klipsch's 90th birthday party. Uh, we also have a picture of Paul uh, and Judy and Fred Klipsch at the time that Fred bought the company in 1989. This case contains most of the important pieces from the Giants, from the very beginning of modern audio. Uh, down here we have a Western Electric 555. Uh, this driver was designed in the mid-20s, reported in 1928, and it was designed by the team of Winty and Thuris at Bell Labs. Uh, it is very nearly state-of-the-art today. It has a two-inch, two-mil thick aluminum diaphragm with edge-wound aluminum wire. Uh, has tangential compliance. Uh, it's about a 25% efficiency, which is unheard of <laughs> today. Uh, this speaker uh, was designed slightly before cinema took on sound, the talkies, but it was very quickly adopted as the basic building block of the first cinema sound systems. Only a few years later, a man named Boswick at Bell Labs uh, designed and patented uh, the tweeter on the bottom here. Uh, this is probably the world's first tweeter, and it did extend the Western Electric uh, systems up above 12,000 hertz. We also have here a Western Electric 31A horn. Uh, it's interesting that this horn was being considered by Paul as the high frequency horn of the Klipsch horn uh, before he designed his own horn. Uh, he also designed a multicellular horn for the Klipsch horn, but I don't think it was ever prototyped due to the complexity. The geometry in the bend of this horn is what Paul mimicked in the design of our four-barrel manifold for our MCM system, and this was in the 1970s. The early 1930s saw a race for more horsepower in the audio industry. By 1933, this compression driver, uh, again from Wente and Thuris, came out, and it is a Western Electric 594. It has a four-inch voice coil and is the basic prototype for all large format professional compression drivers today. Uh, also in the case, this is a Altec 604B duplex, uh, probably late 40s. Here we have a Jensen three-way. It's the famous Triax. It's a G610. Uh, this was disclosed in 1950 by the team of Plock and Williams. Up here, we have an Electrovoice version of the Ionovac tweeter. That is an ion, ionized air principle tweeter. Uh, it goes very high in frequency, uh, but it also goes very high in modulation distortion. One of the more interesting items we have is a Dilks vocal air driver. This is a modulated Airstream driver. Uh, you would buy this driver and uh, also buy an air compressor with it. It ran off of about 30 pounds of compressed air going into this fitting. You put a horn up here, and this was the entire PA system in the late 1940s for a Greyhound racetrack. 
the principle of modulated airstream is what gives us the most acoustic output of any audio device short of dynamite. Uh, this principle was used at Cape Kennedy uh, in the mid 60s. Uh, they had to have very high pressure speakers to test the atmosphere prior to the launch. Uh, the Saturn V rocket put out 50 million acoustic watts, which would be the equivalent of 10 million cliptrons at full output. Uh, that was a lot of sound. They did have to generate 100,000 acoustic watts just to see if the atmosphere was amenable to a launch. We also have a Western Electric 640AA microphone. This was a laboratory microphone, and I believe it's about 1946. Uh, Paul used this for a long time in his measurements. We also have a Western Electric 755 8-inch woofer uh, and a very early electric voice compression driver. Down in the bottom uh, is a Cobra Flex horn from University. Uh, Paul actually used a few of these in some Clipshorn Junior models, which I have never seen one, uh, but he was not proud of the fact. <laughs> it was not that good a horn. But there are a few out there. Wrapping up our Western Electric items uh, from early sound, we have a Western Electric 11A public address form. Uh, we also have a Western Electric 22A movie theater horn, typically used with direct radiator woofers. Uh, and we also have a much larger full range uh, double barrel Western Electric 16A. Uh, this is interesting in that it's only two foot in depth, so it would fit behind uh, screens that had very limited space. All of these horns utilize the 555 driver. Hot on the heels of Western Electric in Cinema Sound was RCA. Uh, this particular RCA movie theater speaker is from the 1930s and was removed from the local Hope movie theater uh, in 1980, and it was still operating. The performance of this type of speaker is what Paul Klipsch wanted to duplicate in a compact home speaker, thus the Klipsch horn. Uh, when Paul went to the patent office with his ideas, uh, he discovered that he was not the first corner horn. However, he amended his claims and he got multiple patents. And we believe a patent on the Klipsch horn is the most effective economical corner horn that there is. Uh, 62 years of production just may corroborate that. This is an RCA cinema corner horn, and it's earlier than the clip horn. It's uh, mid 30s uh, to late 30s. Uh, the high frequency horn is solid brass. Here in the center of the room, we have a cluster of Paul Voigt horns from the 1930s. Paul Voigt used the Tractrix expansion rate in his corner horns. Uh, he is one of the giants that we more recently stood on their shoulders. Over here, the earliest Voigt piece that we have is a two-foot uh, public address speaker, and the driver is a waterproof driver. Uh, this is probably very early 1930s. The bottom of this case houses mostly English I thought. Uh, we have the drivers out of the Voigt corner horns here. One of them is an electromagnetic device. Uh, we have a Lowther driver with the phasing plug. Uh, here we have a Deca ribbon loaded horn speaker. Uh, we even have a Voigt recone kit, which may be the earliest recone kit in existence. Uh, on the shelf above, we have uh, the some of the test equipment that Paul used uh, very early in his career. One of the more interesting to me is this bullet-shaped H.H. Scott sound level meter. Paul and Scott were friends, and occasionally they would co-op at some of the New York audio fairs. Uh, back down to the bottom, one of the most interesting pieces to me in the back is a horn-loaded Tractrix tweeter, uh, and it is
is a ribbon diaphragm, and the gigantic magnet structure on it, I have been told, was a World War II surplus magnetron magnet. Also, uh, I have read literature on Leak, and Leak was working on a speaker very similar. This speaker could possibly be related to the Leak uh, horn-loaded ribbon. 